Welcome everybody um, to the third and final installment of the Meister Online Trilogy. Um, it's been fantastic so far um, and I'm most sincerely looking forward to today. Um, I think we are going out with a bang with six phenomenal speakers. So I'm really looking forward to um, getting started. So uh, before we get going, just a few housekeeping um, issues to address. Um, just to, um, I suppose, set the tone, the MICER is a meeting I think focused on how to do um, research. So the talks are, are pitched um, in a socially discursive way. Um, we strive for an atmosphere of fun and one that is most importantly supportive to all because there's lots of people here who are, are at varying stages of the, the research journey. So there is a code of con conduct on the MISA website and uh, that sets out the ways in which we can all create a safe space um, for people at all stages of the chemistry education research journey to share their thoughts. So the technical details. Um, can everybody please mute their microphone and turn off the camera during the talks? This is just to preserve the bandwidth and um, in, uh, it enhance the, the quality of the speaker's video. Um, during recordings, the main screen is recorded, but the chat and breakout rooms are not recorded. So if you are assigned to breakout rooms during the talks, feel free to turn on your camera um, or mic if you wish for discussions. Okay. And as always, for everyone in the Twitter sphere, any tweets um, include the, the MICER hashtag, mice, hashtag MICER20. Okay. So following on from last week's or the, the session two, we held a minute silence for all who were impacted by racism around the world. So to follow it up this week and in, in solidarity with the glo global protests that are happening around the world against injustice, we wanted to make a meaningful contribution. So as many more people registered um, than was expected at the, at the start of um, in the planning stages of MISA, we were able to make a donation to charity that supports education. So LEAD Scotland is a voluntary organisation that's set up to empower disabled young, uh, young people and adults and carers across Scotland to access learning opportunities. So on behalf, on behalf of MISA participants, we have donated £500. So, um, to give a brief overview of the um, lineup today, um, our first speaker is Linda Dunlop. We'll be followed by Sylvia Markick and uh, Lilith from Ludwigsburg before our coffee break. So to introduce Linda, um, Linda is a lecturer and deputy director of undergraduate studies at the University of York in England. So. Linda has, has a vast experience of, of teaching science all over the world, from the UK to the US to Mexico. Um, Linda has made ha, has had some recent CERF publications, which I feel is incorporating a really nice um, perspective to chemistry education research. And these studies report on students' perceptions of fracking and um, how Linda is pioneering research on philosophical dialogue in chemistry education research. And I really enjoyed her paper on the talking chemistry program um, that she's working on at York and how it's contributing to students' learning experiences today there. So today Linda is going to introduce us to some of the aspects of that research and the methodological considerations that were made along that way. So without further ado, um, I will invite Linda to um, share her screen. Thanks, Ashley. Let me see. Um, um, is that sharing okay? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Great. Um, thank you so much um, for the introduction and um, for organising this 
wonderful conference. It's been so friendly and welcoming, so I really um, appreciate that. Um, in this talk, I have about 15 slides, about five on the background, the kind of philosophical dialogue um, intervention that I was talking about, a third on the capabilities approach, which is the framework that um, guided the research, and then just a couple looking at the data and the conclusions um, from, the pro from the project. There are a couple of interaction points, um, some breakout rooms um, and a poll, and I'll try and give a heads up when they're coming and feel free to grab the screen if, if anybody wants to at any point. Um, so, oh, sugar, how, how do I move? Ah, there. <laughs> Can't move slides on. Um, yeah, and I think um, I'd really like to um, thank my collaborators on this work. So we tend to do field work when it's wild and windy, but that's maybe just because the weather's always wild and win windy. Um, Maria, Lucy, um, and Denise um, have done work on capabilities in relation to fracking and Annie and Josh has disappeared somewhere um, have been involved in the talking chemistry project so huge thanks to them um, for being wonderful colleagues. Um, so I think it's important to set the background of this work against the context of chemistry education in England We've got one of the narrowest school curriculums, which encourages early specialisation. And yet the world we live in is uh, increasingly complex. And as we've seen during the pandemic, I think we need to see science um, in a much broader context, including the ethical, social and political context. And this is a point that's made by the current president of the Royal Society and um, Nobel Prize in Chemistry winner, um, Venki Ramakrishnan. I'll just give um, a minute or so to read that, but I think this is really important for the context um, of the work. So I think much work in chemistry education is quite rightly focused on um, the development of subject specific knowledge and skills. And that's really important, particularly if we want to know how to how to teach better and promote better student learning, but that really wasn't the context of this work. Um, we were working in an extracurricular um, environment with colleagues on a philosophy, chemistry and education project. So our aim was to encourage young people of university age and of school age to think and talk about big ideas in chemistry that can't be understood just using chemistry. Um, so things like fracking, geoengineering, drug design and use, they all have, you know, chemistry knowledge is really important for that, those subjects, but not just chemistry knowledge. Um, we think that they require a kind of philosophical approach, um, but few students in England certainly get a chance to do any philosophy during their school educations, during their degree or during teacher education programmes. So what we wanted to do was just raise awareness of the possibilities of philosophy for chemistry students. So we worked first with university students. We um, ran workshops with them, gave them the sort of opportunity to practice and play with each other. And then we organised educational experiences with them, um, with the wider university community and in schools. So we had quite a small group of participants, 25 second year students, 23 of them chemists, one education student and one in philosophy. And that was kind of surprising to us that there was so much interest in this from the chemistry students in particular and not so much from the philosophy or education students. So following a series of workshops and meetings on campus, students took workshops that they designed into schools. So they did one on better brains and better bodies and getting students to think about philosophical questions in relation to that theme and alien adventures on Twin Earth um, to the wider university community. So the approach that we used was um, to integrate philosophy, education and chemistry. It was doing philosophy for children um, which is a movement that's kind of started in the 70s with Matthew Lipman in um, Montclair State University. Um, so we use these approaches to doing philosophy with, um, with the students. So we gave them opportunities to do thought experiments, to analyse concepts, to create and critique arguments, create philosophical questions and discuss these with each other. Um, we did it over a series of workshops, so we're really focused on building building a sense of community um, and if you look at the supplementary materials in 
the um, CERP article, um, there's some examples of the sorts of things that we developed and students developed as a result. <coughs> so we took a philosophical question to be a question which is open to informed, rational and honest disagreement that's constrained by scientific knowledge, but it's answered through reasoning rather than experiment. And um, I'll show you some um, questions that the students created in a moment and we'll have a chance to discuss some of those and talk about them in a um, breakout room. Um, so yeah, it's happy hour somewhere in the world, I assume, um, it it's, must be nearly at here. Um, so one of the outreach activities that the students planned was a philosophy loft. Um, I would have called it a philosophy pub or bar, but um, I think they're just, they got that trend, haven't they? <laughs> so um, during one week, one planet week, it was a campus wide week to celebrate and raise awareness of sustainability issues. So the students in this uh, talking chemistry um, group created a bar and cafe after class. Um, so at the end of it, it was six o'clock in the afternoon. So all teaching and finish for the day. Um, they created a bar and cafe where staff and students could, instead of paying for a drink, they exchanged an idea for a drink. So they discussed the um, philosophical question with the bartender. They had their drink. And then we had some other kind of prompts around the room. So. We didn't have beer mats, but um, we did have some doilies with um, philosophical questions on those. So to give you a flavour of the discussions, we're going to use the breakout rooms um, to, to think about these um, and what sort of possibilities they offer. So we're going to shortcut a whole pile of hard work on creating principles of discussion and respect. <laughs> um, I think that's already been um, discussed in the kind of principles of Vermeister um, and we're also going to miss out a lot of the work with the analysis of key concepts but it's still a nice way to get to know each other a little bit better and get a taste of the activities I think. So um, I'm going to give you just a minute to read some of these philosophical questions that were created for One Planet Week um, and they were designed to be accessible to all students and staff not just chemists. Um, just choose one that really resonates with you um, and think about the reasons why um, and then I, Michael, maybe you'll put people into um, breakout rooms and just share the question that you've identified with your reasons um, and maybe your initial response um, and if you just go in alphabetical order in the breakout room, we'll say like six minutes or something and then um, call you back. Uh, great, so just so I'm clear, so we want rooms of about maybe five per room? That would be great, thanks. Shall I also copy the questions and the to the to the chat, would that be? Yeah, so if you could, if you could grab the picture questions they're interested in and they can paste it in their own chat room. Okay, so that's about 50, um, so let me just figure that out. Oh, this might be beyond my Zoom skills. Do I stop sharing? Okay, so the questions are copied in the chat along with the... Okay, so I'm going to assign people to rooms now, so you just need to accept the invitation. If you leave a room, there's a breakout room button at the bottom. You click on that to be able to reconnect. So, off you go. Thanks, Mike.
Uh, if anybody's in the main room and then looking to join a room, you just need to click on the join link um, or the breakout room button at the bottom, you should be able to connect. Hi, Michael. Um, would you Bring call people it. back um, mm -hmm. in the next minute or so, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll just close our rooms now, so it'll be just a 60 second countdown. Seamless. <laughs> Hi, Michael. I was in um, Breakout Room 21, I got like. Yeah, so we're just bringing people back into the main room now. Oh, okay. All right. Never mind. Yeah, so just a um, 35 seconds left and everybody will be back in the main room. Okay. Um, I'll just stay here then. Am I um, okay to press share screen again now or should I? Yeah. Yeah.
So we just have about 10 seconds left, and I'll give you a shout out, but it'll be in the main room. All right, so that's it. Everybody is, uh, everybody is back in now. Thank you. <laughs> But, um, hopefully um, that was a nice way to get to know each other, perhaps start to think about what certain keywords meant or questions, maybe got straight into kind of your position on something. Um, not sure if we had time for much disagreement, but, um, but that was fine. But the, the questions themselves, I think, are really simply stated, but allow students to learn a lot from and about each other when they discuss it. Michael, is that background with me? I'm in here just to say, remember to mute your microphones and cameras when you come back in, please. Thanks. Okay. Um, so with all the freedom that students had um, to decide what questions they would ask, um, and how they would translate what they'd learned into an educational experience for young people in schools. It was really difficult to kind of tie down specific measurable learning outcomes. So these are all the things that we talked about that we thought, oh, we might be able to um, achieve some of these things, but um, they all seemed quite limited and limiting for what we were trying to do. So given the range of possible outcomes and the fact that they might be different for different students, um, and they might have different things that were important, we decided to use the capabilities approach to help us understand um, the impact of the project. And um, I came to know about capabilities through my collaboration with Eleanor Brown, who is a development educator, and we had previously worked together on a living learning community, um, a global learning community, um, kind of outside chemistry education. So although the subject matter was very different, both projects were focused on non-formal learning and on educational experiences that aim to develop young people beyond curricular knowledge. So it comes out of Amartya Sen's theory of justice and capabilities approach is really a way of understanding justice, which links well-being not just with what a person ends up doing, so it Sen would call that their functioning, but also the freedom that they have to achieve the functioning that they desire. So um, there's a really nice example that Sen uses um, of hunger. So hunger is like functioning. So a person can be hungry due to lack of food, or they can be hungry by choice if they were fasting or dieting. So both of those people, the the person who's starving and the person who's fasting or dieting share the same functioning of hunger. They have very different capabilities. So the, the capabilities that the person who is fasting or dieting, they've got greater choice, they've got freedom to choose to be other than hungry. Um, so a person's capabilities depend on their own life conditions, including their economic, political and civil rights and their access to resources. So it's kind of a way of measuring well-being of individuals, not of averages. And that's what really appealed to us here. Um, and capabilities approach, oh, that image is gone as well, has been advanced by Martha Nussbaum as well. Um, and she has identified 10 central capabilities, which I think I've copied onto um, a the next slide anyway, to be considered essential for human dig dignity. And these capabilities, she's, she sees these as all important and irreducible to each other. It would have been really in interesting and useful to have an understanding of what capabilities that chemists and chemistry educators um, think are important to try and develop in their students, but we didn't have that at the outset of the, uh, of the project. So I thought this might be an interesting, um, a good chance to find out what what you think it's important to develop in young people. So um, there's going to be a poll in a second and the question is which of Nussbaum's central capabilities are relevant to chemistry education and if there's anything that's missing then if you maybe note that in the chat. So um, here these should be on the poll in a second so oh, which of these capabilities are developed through chemistry education you should be able to select all or none of these. Um, and if there's anything that you think, oh, we really do this in chemistry education, if you could maybe note that in the chat. So that poll is live now. Thanks.
Okay, um, thanks for that. So, interestingly, like practical reason is, um, can you see the results? So I will share the results now. Okay. Um, practical reason, very high, unsurprisingly, um, but other species seems quite low. Um, and in the work that we've started to do on fracking, that's quite interesting because a lot of the young people um, felt um, that there was an impact of fracking on other species, which impacted on their well-being, um, which I'll, I could make that point a bit better in writing, but it's quite interesting seeing the um, distribution of, of these things. I can't see the chat, but I'll maybe um, pick up on anything that's been added in um, the chat later. So, oh, can I close this poll? Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so, like I say, we didn't have um, a kind of idea from the chemistry or chemistry education community about what capabilities might be important. Um, so, we drew on some um, existing capabilities. Um, and the way that we used capabilities to inform the research um, was that we um, used it to design the interview guide. So making sure that we were asking questions about what was important to young people, um, what they valued. And, um, we also used it to analyze the qualitative data that we got through the interviews and then also in the interpretation um, of that data. So we really centered on how students understood the experience and the extent to which it was um, it helped them to develop outcomes of value to them. So the list of capabilities that we used um, were Melanie Walker's. So she's done a lot of work on capabilities in, in higher education. Um, and she based these this list of capabilities on um, her review of the literature, which takes in Martha Nussbaum's work, and also on work with her own students. And we thought that it could be quite a powerful thing if we were to um, claim that to develop these capabilities through an extracurricular chemistry project because these fundamentally relate to student well-being and the ability of students to live a life of value to them and I think for any of us who work in higher education I think student well-being at the moment is um, a real concern. So um, we're going to use these in a second to analyse a piece of data. Um, what we understood by these was so for learning disposition we um, took that any time a student talked about curiosity or being interested in doing or finding out more, we coded that as learning disposition. Um, educational resilience, um, where they talked about negotiating risk or persevering in the face of adversity. Knowledge or imagination, that was where they talked about gaining disciplinary or professional knowledge. Respect, dignity and recognition was about showing empathy and compassion, fairness, generosity, listening to others and speaking out was an important part of that. Um, bodily integrity doesn't kind of instantly think, oh, we'll be doing this through um, philosophical dialogue, but that, that included freedom from physical and verbal harassment. Emotional integrity was about coping constructively and productively with stress. So not avoiding difficult situations, but being able to um, negotiate those. Um, practical reason to do with making choices based on reasoning and social relations and social networks. Anywhere they talked about building trust, making friends or participating in group work. So um, on the next slide, I'm going to show um, some data. Um, it's from one of the participants, a chemistry undergraduate student, in response to the question um, what they would take away from the project that they valued. And we applied these themes to all of our interview guides. Um, so we analysed them using these um, as themes. So I'd just like to ask what you can see on this, um, on this data. So I think maybe we don't quite have time to go into breakout rooms again. So maybe if we just do this um, individually and post some comments, identifying capabilities in the chat. Um, I will, let's see. So here's the data and then I'm just gonna post the list of these capabilities in the chat. And then, 
So here we go. So there's the list of the capabilities and here is the data. So I'll just shut up for two minutes and <laughs> let me think. Um, So I think this is a, I've just um, asked to do something completely unreasonable, I think, which is to try to do some qualitative analysis under like a two minute um, time pressure. But um, yeah, I, on the next slide, I'll show you the sorts of things that we highlighted um, in the data. And I think throughout this, when um, we were working together, we sometimes coded things quite differently and had to discuss, you know, well, I think they're talking about that. Um, and really draw on the context for what was being said. But I think there are kind of three main capabilities that we can see in this, um, in this data. So um, in blue, I think that's to do with educational resilience because the students talking about feeling less, um, less scared, feeling braver about pre when presenting and challenging their views. And they talked earlier about that being really difficult um, at the start, but it's something that they got through developing as a community, developing trust and confidence in each other. Um, in purple, we've um, we decided that, that was probably to do with respect, dignity and recognition because they're talking about how to um, support other students and how to challenge effectively and really thinking about doing that in a non control confrontational way, which I think is so important um, in life to be able to challenge people, um, but not in a way that causes anger or um, but yeah, sensitively um, and through questioning. And then in green, we think um, that's to do with emotional and bodily integrity because they're talking about coping with difficult situations, recognizing discomfort in their peers and responding to support, whether through body language or talk. Um, and I think, yeah, they're, these things are valuable in life, um, but also in chemistry, because um, I don't know, I think we're talking later about peer review process, but you know that um, we need these capabilities to cope with um, that in chemistry and chemistry education. So um, what are the conclusions really in terms of methods? Um, I think capabilities approach is a way of evaluating chemistry education which is based on individuals well-being rather than satisfaction and it takes takes each individual's experience as important um, it also allows researchers to identify what it is that students value and this can uh, inform us when we are um, design and learning experiences within the curriculum so can we tweak things to um, help students to develop their capabilities to help them to lead lives that they they value um, and future work might examine how chemistry might uniquely or specifically um, help to contribute to specific capabilities so um, yeah future directions really for us are we um, are incorporating this idea into an optional third year chemistry module so that um, 
more students have experience of it um, and we'd like to develop support for increasing the quality of argumentation and really spotting bad arguments and being able to challenge those um, sensitively and effectively. Um, and then in thinking about the capabilities approach in chemistry education research, um, I think we could do some further work to understand how chemistry education contributes to capabilities and examine the impact of different interventions on capabilities. Um, I had hoped to have some time for questions, but I can pick them up in the chat later. Um, yeah, and there's some references there. So thank you again very much, Ashley and Michael, for um, welcoming me. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Linda, um, for a fantastic talk. I think it was um, really stimulating in terms of thinking about the bigger picture, the bigger philosophical picture of chemistry education and what we set out to achieve when teaching chemistry. And chemistry education, I really think, is, has a long way to go yet to further consider those dimensions of our education. And um, there's been, I, I think, the um, questions that came from the students at the beginning in the first breakout room activity, I know we had a great chat myself and um, Alice in London um, on the, the, the sophistication of the questions that students came up with and I think um, speaking through philosoph um, philosophy is a really powerful um, point to access what they know and how they're using what they know and how they can potentially use what they know in various different ways to make sense of the bigger picture. So. Um, Thank you, Linda. So, um, right, to move on, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Or our next uh, speaker team, should I say. 